Tracing the twists and turns in our family tree very often involves dusty vaults, dead ends and false leads. But we all carry a key that can unlock a history long lost to us. It's our DNA. Twelve New Zealanders have had their DNA tested, and that's going to help them to solve old family mysteries, uncover ancient forebears, and even find a fortune or two. Stay tuned for a fascinating ride. Hello, welcome to the DNA HQ. Following the twists in our family tree can take us back hundreds of years. And once you start searching for secrets hidden in your DNA, then the stories can lead back thousands, even tens of thousands of years. Actor Robbie Mungasiva and journalist Nadine Chalmers Ross have submitted to a DNA test in a bid to discover what runs in their blood. And there's a tiger in this tale, and it's a real one. Amazing to find out what I thought might have been a family myth is actually reality, but it's grim. It's so grim. Ni hao pong yo. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Yeah. The first thing I would say to my family about this, honestly, I'd say it, it blew my mind. Kind of emotional, actually. Robbie Mangasiva spent his younger years in Samoa, where his family's main form of entertainment was listening to their father tell stories. Perhaps some of them were true. We have his DNA results, and they'll help to clear up a mystery or two. But first, let's learn what Robbie knows about his ancestry. We lived in Samoa for probably five years. Uh, two of us were born here in New Zealand. The first, myself, and the second eldest, Steve. And then we came back. Uh, so did a bit of growing up in the bush. I know very little about mum's side of the family. She's quite fair. Speaking to dad, years of talking to dad, and dad can go on a little bit. He seems to think that side of the family comes from um, Samoan royalty. I don't know, and this is why I'm here to find out, hopefully. Apparently in Samoa, I'm royalty. It's Robbie, hello. Hi, welcome. Richard. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Absolute Sit down. pleasure. Welcome to the, a more gentle interrogation room than you'd find on Wentworth. <laughs> now, now uh, a few questions, really. Yep. You, you, um, you were born in New Zealand, but uh, at some stage you, you went back to Samoa? Yeah, went back to Samoa when I was, I'm guessing, around about three or four. Mm -hmm. And then I, I was, at the time, could speak English. Mm -hmm. And then the time I was in Samoa, I lost my English and was fluent in Samoan. And then when I came back in 82, I had to relearn English again. But um, yeah, time in Samoa, what I can remember of it, it was very simple. I know there's one issue yeah. that you're interested in. There's, uh, that you have some questions about your mother's ancestry that you'd like to be resolved. Yeah, because... There's some of us that mum is quite fair, um, you know, compared to dad. Dad's a lot darker than mum is. And I always fascinated whether there was any, I don't know, possibly European blood in her. Okay. Right, we've got some of your results. And if we look at the screen over there, we'll be able to see them. So you have 62% Southeast Asian markers and 36 Oceana. Here's one thing that's very interesting. You are the very first person that we've ever had with 0% European DNA. So that means your mother most certainly doesn't have any German or European ancestry whatsoever. No way, not possible. Yes! Yes! And there's another piece of information about your mother's ancestry, but you're going to have to wait for that oh, until you're on really? the road. And in the meantime, I want you to take this and I'll be in touch with you in about 24 hours. Have a wonderful journey. Thank you, Richard. Thank you for coming in. Well, Robbie does have royal blood, but the big surprise is how Robbie's great-great-grandfather became king, lost his crown, and then won it back again. Robbie's great-great-grandfather, King Lao Pepper, was his nation's second king. And our Samoan scholar, Damon Salesia, is going to fill Robbie in on his royal ancestry. I've been given this. Yeah, so this is Maliatoa Laupepa. Maliatoa. Who who's, um, you know, has an incredible life and a really important political figure in Samoa. Right. 
And he, he's one of the leaders of uh, one side of the Maliator family, yeah. and they come into conflict. You know, really intense and long-lasting conflict yeah. between him yeah. and his uncle to become the king. So they go to war, and Lao Pepa doesn't have much luck against his uncle. What happens is the empires, and there's three big empires in Samoa at the time, the Germans, the British, and the Americans. And in the end, the Germans actually end up supporting him being exiled. So he's actually sent up yeah. to, um, to the Northern Pacific, to another German colony. And then they bring him back and he ends up king again. Um, and so if, yes. if you're connected to that, it's an absolutely powerful, mm. fascinating, and you know, a really Pacific moment of islanders mm. together. Wow, I'm actually getting goosebumps. Man, this guy looks just like my father. Because Dad did mention there was royalty that ran through our blood. But, and this has just confirmed it. Robbie, King Lao Pepper's time in exile involved many, many months sailing with the Germans, and that seems to have spread his DNA about a bit. Now you're going to meet your third cousin, George, in rural Seattle. Wow. All right. Seattle. Cool. Hi, doggy. Howdy. Hello. How are you? Good, how are you? I'm great. Is George here? I'm George. Hey, man. Robbie, nice to meet you, nice man. Nice to meet you. Wow, eh? Come on Love in. It. Yeah, definitely. The lab have compared Robbie and George's DNA, and they're likely to be third cousins. What did you think when you got the phone call that some weird Polynesian guy was coming over <laughs> to, to, to meet you and somehow there was that DNA connection? I had, a, uh, I guess you could say, an image in my head of uh, a Samoan rugby player. Did you? Yeah, that's, that's what I was telling my, my wife, is that I'm, I'm pretty sure he's going to probably be a yeah. Samoan guy, maybe a rugby player. It's funny because I had a, quite a successful career as a rugby player. When I was playing, it was still amateur. When I left rugby, when I quit rugby, it just become professional. Well, since we have similar genetic makeup, does that mean I can be a rugby player? Hell yes! Yes, I think I have the body. We can tackle each other. <laughs> Wait, that's getting weird now. <laughs> we'll tackle each other and yeah, switch shirts. Yeah, switch shirts. <laughs> oh, this must be an adventure for you, though. You're traveling all over to meet people yeah. who are genetically tied to you. Thus far, what I know about um, my DNA is um, my great great grandfather. He was the I think it might have been the second second king of Samoa. His name was uh, La Laupepa. Do you see a resemblance? Totally, <laughs> totally. Like the photo looked like my father. As soon as I saw that photo, I said, "That's dad." It's, it's kind of the neat thing about DNA is it leaves breadcrumbs across. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Your genetics to 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 help you find out where you came from. Yeah. So George and I were talking and we were trying to figure out how we were third cousins. Turns out his dad grew up in the Pacific, not far from where Lao Pepa was exiled. My family believes that they're from Guam, but in the genetic research, the genes that are islander are coming from the Samoan islands down in that area. Right. My grandmother always thought that uh, we were uh, too skinny, though, which I think is kind of funny. She was always That's sick. a common thing. Always trying That's to a common food. thing. Although, my grandmother would tell me I'm too fat. <laughs> <laughs> but the, the common one is like, you're too skinny, you need to eat more. Need to eat more, yeah. 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 Oh, did, did, did your grandmother ever sniff your head? She used to whack my head. <laughs> <laughs> Not sniff it, maybe that was her way of sniffing my head. <laughs> <laughs> you did some time in the army? Yes, yes. I joined the army when I was uh, 17. And I was in the first wave into Iraq with uh, the 101st Airborne. Yeah, it was my platoon that were the ones that uh, got Saddam Sons, Yudin Kuse. A four hour firefight. Yeah, usually when you kick down their door in the middle of the night and come in and grab them, they don't want to fight. Yeah. But uh, they put up a fight. How were you emotionally? I was, I was pretty messed up. So when you go through combat, yeah, you lose a friend or you see something very traumatic, you have to just stuff it down inside. And after doing that for a long time, it kind of kind of wore me out when I got home. But, uh, that's when you decided, is that when you decided to get out? 
So I decided to grow pot. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a, a pot farmer. So I grow... Say that uh, again, I just want to hear it. <laughs> I'm a pot farmer. <laughs> I grow uh, uh, legal marijuana here in Washington State. And Say that again. I just want to hear legal it. Legal marijuana. Just so New Zealanders <laughs> can hear this. Legal, legal, legal. marijuana Aotearoa. It was interesting. They were just so open about it. You know, even having the conversation, then there was George's 10-year-old daughter there. It's what Dad did, and I think they kind of understood extracted stuff is like 98% yeah. THC so usually one hit of that you're you're hanging out with Jesus Buddha and Muhammad all at the same time <laughs> I have no idea what they're talking about <laughs> we just pretend they're talking about lollies meeting George was um, was really great opened up my eyes to to my family history learning about Lao Pepa and how his genes spread through to the Pacific mm -hmm. and how here in America makes me think about my dad's stories and how I, I wished I'd listened to them. Sorry, Pops. Later on, Robbie's DNA odyssey starts shaping up to be his own Orient Express. Hang hao. Hang hao. Miss Dad, very good. You did a good job. And standing by is journalist Nadine Chalmers Ross who's also about to discover that she has a rather exotic family connection. I actually feel a little bit nervous. And that's weird, because they're family, right? They have to like me. Hello, good to have you back. Now, for a long time, people have seen DNA testing as something that belongs to the criminal section of the nightly news. But taking a test, a simple teaspoon of saliva, is all it takes to unlock all kinds of information about our ancestors and the lands that they came from. As a business journalist on television for many years, Nadine Chalmers Ross has explained the big stories of the day, but now it's time to delve into her own story. What will that reveal? And what does she know already? Let's find out. I think that I might find I am a bit of a bitzer. If I was a dog, I suppose they'd call me a mongrel. I grew up hearing stories from my grandfather about growing up in India. And when I look at my father, he's very dark. I'm not sure why, but I would really like to find out that I had Indian blood in me. It seems somehow more exotic. Then on my mother's side, her maiden name is Thin. She tells me there are some links to the owner of Longleat and the Marquis of Bath. And my mum said when she lived in the UK, people automatically called her Lady Thin. I think I like the sound of that. Nadine, come Hello. in. Sit yourself down. Make yourself at home. Lovely to meet you. Now, New Zealander, how many generations? Well, my grandfather on my father's side was the first one to arrive on that side of the family. The first one? He was born in India, and it's my understanding so was his father and the generation before that, before that as well. OK. And uh, they were English people? That's right. English family living in India. Mm -hmm. So Grandad Bon. B-O-N-N, -N. that sounds German to me. Well, it was a nickname. His name was Herbert, but he was the youngest of three boys, and his mother always called him her Bonnie Baby. And it stuck. He was Bon for the rest of his life. Oh, OK. Well, there's, there's a story about Grandad Bon, isn't there, that, that he used to tell about a pussycat? <laughs> a rather large pussycat. I, I used to tell me the story of a tiger that killed his grandfather, so my great-grandfather. How extraordinary. Yeah, and I don't know much more about the story than that, but I've always been told it. <laughs> now, you want to know more about your, 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 your background and, and, the, and, the, and the various strains of your family from where they've come, and we're going to look at some of the results we've got over here on the screen. Right, the map shows that 95% are European, most of that's from the UK and, and Ireland, but there are traces of Scandinavian, French and German, and a minuscule amount of Ashkenazi Jewish markers. Now, you were hoping to find uh, an Indian connection. We can see that you've got 5% South Asian markers. So, given your family history, we are fairly confident that this represents your Indian connection and family. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> now, that doesn't mean to say that the tiger story is true, mm. but, it, you know, it could be. I'm going to give you this little device here, which I want you to keep about your person. 
and I shall be in touch within the next 24 hours to give you further instructions. In the meantime, bon voyage. Thank you so much for coming in. Thank you, Richard. Now, mind the door, it sticks a bit on your way out. It, well, you'll, you'll, you'll manage, I'm sure. Oh, there we go. Um, well, Nadine has a great reputation as a news hound, but she's also sitting on an epic tale which is about to get her the scoop of her life. Nadine, we found a photo that we'd like you to have a look at. Now, this man is your great, great uncle, Clan Duncan Ross. Now, I want you to take this photo to London, where we've arranged for you to meet another of Clan Duncan's relatives. And he holds the key to some very, very interesting family tales. Wow. So the Ross family is leading me to London. It's kind of eerie. This guy looks just like my dad strong family resemblance. No time for sightseeing, Nadine. We've arranged for you to meet a DNA relative in that favourite of British meeting places, the local pub. I actually feel a little bit nervous. This is unusual for me, but maybe even a bit shy. And that's weird, cos they're family, right? They have to like me. Head to the Lamb on Holloway Road, where Michael and Casey are waiting to tell you tales of your colonial Indian past. I feel like I should give you a cuddle with yeah. family, really, aren't we? <laughs> <laughs> Hello. Hello. Michael is a relative, but it's his wife, Casey, who's been digging around the family tree and discovering wealthy Indian roots. So I've been shown this picture of Clan Duncan. How does he make me related to you? Clan Duncan is my great-great-grandfather. And he's the brother of your great-grandfather. Wow, I can really see the likeness to my father. It's yep. quite striking, given that that's his... It would be his great-uncle. I want to show you some photos of my dad. This is in profile, so it's a little harder to see. Amazing, yeah. There's a lot of similarity there. Really? It, it is. Yeah. Sort of... <laughs> quite scary. And I'll show you my grandfather. He passed away two years ago, but that was not long before he died. Oh. But I still see it in the cheekbones. Absolutely, the cheekbones are there, definitely. Yeah. Bond's father was a man named James George, and Clan Duncan was his brother. But Casey has uncovered even more relatives. The, the first Ross we really know a bit about is the Clan Duncan and James George father, whose name was uh, Duncan Hamilton. And Duncan Hamilton was born in 1840. So probably, as you know, you are partially Indian. Yeah. yeah. What my theory is that Duncan Hamilton's mother, Anne, was Indian. It's fascinating because I people have long asked me what my ethnic makeup was and I've never been able to answer it definitively. So now I feel like I can say that I am part Indian, even if it's only a small amount. Um, I feel like I've answered that question and the rest of my family for them as well. I can go back and say I've got some answers. Duncan Hamilton most likely was half Indian. And he was, he was the first Ross we actually know about. We know that he had an indigo plantation. Just to kind of show you how affluent that family was, the oldest sister, she married a um, British baronet. She was really affluent and they mixed with Maharajas, Indian Maharajas at the time. But they were they're quite affluent. They were part of the Raj. They really lived the, you know, the life of Raleigh. Mm. But, uh... You can see pictures of their daily life. They went polo playing, playing polo in Jaipur, elephant being bathed. They go on hunting trips with the elephants France, and stuff. Yeah. yeah. So on the beach, sunbathing. That's them on a day out, just enjoying their life. It was quite an amazing lifestyle. So, Nadine, you and Michael share a great-great-grandfather, Duncan Hamilton Ross, and to find out more about Duncan and your family's life in India, you're going to have to travel to Kolkata. Coming up, while tracing his mother's line, Robbie makes sure that the hills of China are alive with the sound of him. Washer, Wangi. And Nadine's mission to uncover her Ross family's roots leads her to an orphanage. Do I look like I could be Indian like you? Yes. Because my ancestors were Indian.
actor Robbie Mangasiva has discovered royalty runs in his blood. Yes, yeah, so this is Malietoa Laupepa. He's now in China uncovering his mother's DNA connections to a famous dynasty. I believe I'm in China. What part of me is Chinese? Probably explains why I like Chinese food. Hello, good morning, Robbie. One percent of your DNA shows Chinese markers. Your test reveals that your mother's Hapla group has links to the Han dynasty, and you're about to get a cultural crash course from John in an ancient Han village. You must be John. Yep. Hi, John. Ni hao peng yo. Ni hao peng yo. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Yeah. Um, this village, what's it called? And tell me a little bit of history about it. The village is called Chuan Di Xia. Chuan Di Xia. Very clear. Just like Chinese said. Good. <laughs> oh, I am 1%. Yeah. Let's have a look around. Yeah, OK. Yep. Chuan Di Xia. Chuan Di Xia. Yeah. Chuan Di Xia. How do I say in Chinese? How do I say my name is Robbie? Okay. I'm I'm from New Zealand. So my name is Robbie. 我是 我是 Lobby. Lobby. Yeah. Robbie. We don't say Robbie. We say Lobby. Lobby. Yeah. 我是 Lobby. 我是 我是 I am. 我是 我是 Lobby. 我是 新西兰人 Xixilan I'm from New Zealand. Xixilan Yang. Good. Xixilan, that's your country name. Yeah. New Zealand. Ah, right, right. New Xixi. Zealand. Xixilan. Yeah. yeah. So, 我是, 我是 lobby. Then, 我是 Xixilan 我是 lobby. 我是 Xixilan Ren. Han Hao. Han Hao. Han Hao. Means that very good. You did a good job. So your child is getting better. Shishi Longren. No, no. <laughs> Shishi Robbie. Bob. Shishi. Washi. Washi. Ah, oh, Washi. Yeah, I am. Washi. Lobby. Yeah. Washi. Shishi Longren. Great. You learn very fast. Ni hao dai eh. John, can you tell me a little bit more about the Han Dynasty? Han family was here around 700 years. Yeah. And so this family came here long time and they keep to continue the family. So now a lot of Han family here. There's no way in the world that I'll ever have come or stepped foot on those paths if it wasn't for this. And to discover that, you know, um, that my DNA was from the Han dynasty. Um, and then that one percent Chinese that I have in me—it's quite awesome. I kind of like that. Washer Huang Di. Great. Yeah. You did great. Washer Huang Di. I'm the emperor. Ah, uh, Robbie. This 600-year-old village requires a lot of manpower to keep it in shape, so you've hit town at the right time because there's a restoration project underway that could really do with a big, strapping lad like yourself. Hey! What I'm doing here is attacking a 600-year-old building. Just for your information, New Zealand. 600. Although this bit here doesn't seem like a 600, this is, this looks like it's uh, a recent thing. I can tell by the texture. See that? Now, if it was more than 600, I'd say probably 40 years ago that was put in there. Shisha. Mm. Sure. Mm. Good night. Those workers, their faces were amazing. Just the contours, the lines, just from being out in the sun every day. Because their faces told a story, you know? As corny as that may sound, you could tell those guys worked their asses off. And they were really friendly. 
journalist Nadine Chalmers Ross has had her suspicions about her Indian heritage confirmed. People have long asked me what my ethnic makeup was, so now I feel like I can say that I am part Indian. Our research has proved that Nadine's great great grandfather's mother was Indian and a native of Kolkata. The Ross family were of British colonial stock. They lived in India from the early 1800s, and so we've sent Nadine to Kolkata to get a feel for the place that her family once called home. Namaste, Nadine. We've discovered that your great-great-grandfather, Duncan Hamilton Ross, took a young bride from an orphanage. Her name was Addie. You might like to take a peek at their marriage certificate. So, the 21st of May, 1860, Duncan Hamilton Ross marries Annie Victoria Wilkinson. Has Duncan Hamilton Ross at 19, listed as a bachelor. Annie Wilkinson, 14. One thing that doesn't seem clear to me is why Duncan Hamilton Ross goes sort of shopping for a bride at an orphanage. And I guess maybe it was the done thing to marry someone young, but why someone in such a vulnerable position? It just seems like an odd concept. Nadine, it's fair to question how your great-great-grandfather found his bride, but this type of match wasn't uncommon in the times of the Raj. Life was harsh, so romance wasn't necessarily a priority. And when Duncan did find Annie, he made a wonderful gesture of adopting her younger sister Mary so that they could stay together. And we've arranged for you to visit an orphanage to gain some perspective on Annie and Mary's early life. Oh, I set that one up for you. Oh, you missed it. From what I've read, the conditions around the time that Mary and Annie would have been in the orphanage were awful. I don't think you can understate how hard life would have been. Do I look like I could be Indian like you? Yes. Because my ancestors were Indian, and they lived in Calcutta. I think yeah. that there would have been an intense feeling of being forgotten. So my great-great-grandma used to be in a school like this one. So I came to see what it was like. How long have you been here? About three years. Three years? Yeah. Watching these kids, it just makes you think how young Annie and Mary must have been. So so young, but also that they must have been fighters. And I guess that's the thing, is the women in my history, they were made of tough stuff. But that's not the end of Annie and Mary's story, because we've found documents that reveal a very unusual love triangle in your family. So, 1904, at the age of 57, Annie dies from cancer, and then later, the same year, Duncan marries her younger sister, Mary. Isn't that odd? Well, what actually sounds like a scandal is, in fact, a very complicated love story. Annie was a minx who ran off with possibly a wealthier man and left Mary to raise her infant son. Mary and Duncan went on to fall in love, and although they couldn't marry until Annie's death, they managed to have eight children together. Oh, yes. One of whom was your great-great-grandfather, James George Ross. This is not the kind of stuff I was expecting to find. I thought that I'd find ancestors, but not the kind of twists and turns that their lives took. It is a bit dramatic, and there's also a lot of heartbreak, which I I guess I wasn't really expecting to find. Coming up, Robbie helps to cook a feast using stones, and Nadine finds her great-great-grandmother's life in India started rough, but ended up in the lap of luxury. So my ancestors would have had a grand house and lots of domestic help. Yes. Dr. Robert Mangasivas discovered that his mother's DNA has links to ancient China. Ni hao, dai 
and he's got even more of a history lesson on the way, he's bound for Taiwan to explore his ancient Polynesian roots. Well, Robbie, as you know, DNA evidence has proved beyond any doubt that Polynesian migration from all the Pacific Islands originated in the East. And it's time for you to get a taste of Taiwanese life so that you can see how similar these cultures are. Can you just ask if it's okay if I get in there and wash the watercress? I can wash the fish for her. I'm just gonna wash the watercress, yeah. Traditional way the Taiwanese cooked, it reminded me more of, of um, doing a umu than anything else. I'll do it for you. This is how we do it back home. So you just want to evenly spread your fingers through the watercress like this. Just kind of taste it, see if it's clean. No, it needs a little bit more. There we go. Another test, see if it's clean. Yep, now it's ready to go. There we go. Love you. Yeah, yeah. Let's hear it again. Yeah. Oh, all right. Okay. Then, okay then. Cool. When I was growing up in Samoa, there was nothing there. Um, so when we first got there, it was just basic living. I think it was just a, almost like a shed that we lived in. Good? They're good. Yeah. Ah! Ah! I got you. Hey, got you. There was no electricity. It hadn't come as far as where we were. And the cooking, mum would be cooking outside on a fire. So it was very basic. And I think. I'm, I'm thankful for that. I learned to appreciate a lot of things now, I think mainly due to, to that upbringing. Is it ready? I know you can. Yeah, it's good. Hang. Oof, oof. Oh. Oh, oh my God. Oh, 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 that is nice. That is awesome. Journalist Nadine Chalmers Ross's DNA journey has taken her to an orphanage in Kolkata. My great great grandma used to be in a school like this one. She's discovered her great great grandparents were Duncan Hamilton and Mary Ross. Duncan Hamilton looks like quite the refined English gentleman, really. But when I look at Mary, I just think, even though it's black and white, you feel like you can see the colour in her. I feel like she looks like an elderly Indian woman. And Mary looks like she lived to a you know, relatively ripe old age. So maybe there's longevity in the genes. Good morning, Nadine. Your great-great-grandmother, Mary, had a rough start growing up in an orphanage, but she and her husband built an empire and lived lavishly. In 1880, they left Kolkata and established an indigo plantation. Now, you really need to see what this would have been like, so believe it or not, your next stop is an old plantation. Indigo was a very popular clothes dye in the 1800s, and it came from a plant with the very same name. Those that farmed it made quite a bit of money. I'm trying to build a picture in my mind of what my ancestors might have lived like. Is it reasonable to think that you know, a grand place like this would have been how they lived? Absolutely. They lived fairly lavish lives. So my ancestors who were indigo plantation owners would have had a grand house and lots of domestic help, that sort of thing. Yes. In fact, at the southern end, the southwestern end of this property was a tennis court, and each uh, child would have an ayah. So like a governess or a yes. nanny or something? nanny, like a nanny. Yes, they would have people who, you know, served food. So they would wear a turban and uh, a towel on their arm. So very so, formal. Yes, very formal affair, very formal. This is indigo ferra tinctoria, the plant that actually made the British rich. 
and it eventually got known as the Devil's Die. The laborers, the peasants, the farmers, they were forced to grow indigo. Did they, that make them angry? It eventually got them angry because that's what they, uh, you, you, you just can't eat indigo. So uh, the peasants actually revolted in many ways. They had uh, the stick and they had axes, they had machetes, they had spears and quite a few British were actually killed. I believe your great great grandmother even learned how to use a gun and you know to protect herself. It's amazing to look at it. It's just this pretty little ferny, you know, flower that it caused such ructions. That's right. <laughs> That's right. Can you believe that this little plant could create such opulence as well as create such hatred in a matter of about a hundred years? So had it not been for that, I could have been an heiress. You could have been. <laughs> what a shame. And had I been younger, I would have met you. <laughs> <laughs> The English living opulent lives while their workers were peasants and paupers troubles me a little bit. I wonder if they were aware that they had Indian blood in them. And I wonder if they treated the Indians any better as a result. I'd like to think so. I'd hate to think that any of my relatives were the ones who were causing the poor to starve, but it's possible. I do think, though, from what I worked out about Duncan, it did seem like he had sympathies with the Indians, because actually you're one of them. Next, Nadine finds that the tiger in the family had a rather sharp bite. It's um, such a phenomenal story. And Robbie Mungasiba dances the night away in Taiwan. Ah. I need a beer. Journalist Nadine Chalmers Ross is in Bengal, where she's learned her family were once wealthy plantation owners. And she's also about to learn the truth about her family's story. Hello, Nadine. Your grandfather, Bon, has regaled you with stories of a death by tiger in the family. Now, what exactly can you recall of that very tall tale? I have heard a story about a tiger. I don't know how much of it is true, but I was told that my great, great grandfather was killed by a tiger. But I don't know much more than that. Well, we have uncovered some gritty details. Your grandfather, Bon, was in fact talking about his grandfather, Walter, who also lived in India. Now, Walter had a reputation as a skilled hunter. And when a tiger was making mischief in a neighboring village, Walter was called upon to remedy the situation. Walter and his men stalked the tiger for 11 miles, and once they were within range, Walter took his shot. He only wounded the beast, and he followed the blood trail to discover the animal concealed in the undergrowth. And as Walter approached, the wounded tiger leapt at him, clawing him in the back of the head. Walter continued to battle the beast, and the tiger was shot dead. And Walter, he turned for home, and he stumbled for two miles, before collapsing from blood loss, and he went to meet his maker. It's such a phenomenal story. Amazing to find out what I thought might have been a family myth is actually reality, but it's grim. It's so grim. I decided to get my DNA tested purely because I was curious and I've been told so many stories over the years that I wasn't really sure which of them were true and which might have been embellished or changed through the generations like Chinese whispers and I thought the science can't lie, right? And I wanted to answer that question that I've always wondered about, do I have Indian blood in me? And my granddad's not around to answer a lot of the questions that I had anymore. And no one else seemed to know the answers. So coming here to India, seeing some of the things he would have seen, made me feel quite connected to him. And I think he would have liked that I was curious to find out where he came from and where I come from. Mm -hmm. 
Robbie Mangasiv has discovered his mother's DNA had links with an ancient Chinese dynasty. And he's also learned that his family connects to Samoan royalty. But that's the end of the royal tour, because now he's in Taiwan looking into the links that Polynesians have with the East. Uh, James. Yeah, I'm James. Oh, get it, James. Hi, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you, man. I'm Robbie. Robbie. Nice Hi, to James. meet you. Thanks nice for having you. me. Nice to meet you. And this is 14. Hi, 14. 14. Hey, hey, how are you? The yeah. host. Nice to meet you, Robbie. It's not the number 14? No, no, no. It means in Army's language, it means fish. Ah. Yeah, yeah so fish, 14 yeah. is fish. Is he a good yeah. fisherman? Yeah, he's good at fishing. Right. Thank you for uh, inviting me. The interesting thing that I'm seeing so far, and I don't know if it means anything, is these patterns. These patterns here, these mm -hmm. ones here, mm -hmm. they're the same as my tattoo. Oh. Oh. It's like here, see? Yeah, yeah, yeah. similar, similar. Because it's interesting, I come from the other side of the world. Yes. And to another tribe where somehow we've got a DNA connection and I'm seeing this is similar to what I've got here and yeah. we, we, you know, we don't know each other. For example, like the number. The number is the number of people. Is he counting? Yeah, 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 he's counting numbers. A number. A number. A number. A number. This is in Samoan. Tasi, Lua, Tolu, Fa, Lima, Ono, Fitu, Valu, Iva, Sefulu. A similarity, eh? Never in my wildest dream did I ever think a culture in Taiwan would the language be similar. You know, when we were counting, I was like, wow. It's that thing of where my DNA started from, you know, that whole journey. Your brother? Yeah. Oh, brother. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> my brother. Hey, Robbie. 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 Hey, discovering that I had links in Seattle and also been in um, Taiwan. What the hey? I loved it. I loved it when, in, in, in Taiwan. You know, and in the, the cultural group, a certain beat to their music that was very similar to the old Samoan pop song. <laughs> It's funny, because as soon as I saw it, because I know that beat, I know that. It reminded me also of the uncles and aunties after a few drinks. You know, no means yes. And it's just dragging you up there and just going for it. It was very similar. The first thing I would say to my family about this, honestly, without going too much into it, I'd say it, it blew my mind. I found out um, a lot more about my history and my my DNA and my, my family than I ever have. I've absolutely loved it. Um, and I've still got more to find out and I'm excited about um, new discovery. But it's been amazing, absolutely amazing. Our DNA contains tiny hints that tell us how our forebears traveled. It shows us where to look, to uncover traces of their lives and the stories we find to help bring them back to life. I wonder who's going to be brave enough to take the test next week. Why don't you join me to find out?